So I want to welcome everybody to uh, to today's webinar with Jonathan Thorpe. Um, we're going to start here in about four minutes. And for now, we're just going to uh, sit and chat. So welcome. So Jonathan, um, I did have a question about the photo you showed me. And unfortunately, I guess we can't show it to anyone else right now. But that uh, photo you shot of the skater kid. Yeah. Any issues with shooting out there these days? Uh, were the kids no. all cool with you? Did you have to stay super far away? Like, how, how were things going with that? Things were fine. Um, I, I grew up skating, so they kind of, once you start saying a couple things, like they know that you know what you're talking about. Yep. And um, I was out there shooting with the Washington Ballet in the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I was like, man, these skaters are cool. And like, this is a spot in DC, Freedom Plaza, where like, you just typically would have a lot of difficulty skating because of the population and security, or whatever. And, to now they can just go out there and skate all day without having to deal with like anything. So it's kind of a weird portrait because it's like, you know, it's the skater kid in his playground essentially, but it's also not authentic to what, how that place would really be. So it's kind of like this strange, just, I don't know. It, even though they're surrounded by kids, it still feels very lonely in the shot. And it's kind of right. what I was going for for that portrait. Did you, uh, did you put that on Instagram or anything? Yeah, I did. Where people can see it? Okay, good, good. Yeah. <clears throat> and occasionally I'm gonna, I'll stop screen sharing and go to full screen when I'm addressing and then I'll go back to screen sharing. Okay. For yeah. My um, so when you're at the Washington Ballet, I just actually, you know, we got 10 seconds to, till I gotta say something. I won't, I won't ask another question. Quite okay. <laughs> um, all right, welcome everybody again. We'll be starting in two minutes um, in the studio with Jonathan Thorpe. Um, two minutes. Uh, so what I was going to ask you, so you're over there at the Washington Ballet. What do you, do you go out front and just see if you can get some street shots in? Do you like walk around with a light on a stand? And no, I walked around full, full, full C stand set up, the whole nine. Um, right. Assistance, a legitimate, you know, produced shoot. Yeah. Uh, I think we had like five or six people with us most of the time and honestly like police have been fine with it uh middle of pennsylvania avenue we didn't see a car for about 20 minutes and a cop rolled by and was just like that looks cool and just kept on riding so nice. it's 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 a i don't it's it's a double-edged sword about how you're supposed to really act right now like in photography it's pretty easy to maintain the whole social distancing thing when you're shooting you don't have to necessarily be right on top of someone at the same time, it's like, well, should I be shooting right now just for the good of the whole thing? So it's a, it's a back and forth. I'm just trying to maintain my own sanity, my, yeah. own creative, my own creative sanity, and keep people as safe as possible at this point. So yeah, I'm losing it, my mind. Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say, it's tough. I'm losing my mind, too. I've been getting out as much as I can. But as I said before, I go out to places where there is no one. So that's how Yeah. I'm yeah. <clears throat> But it's cool. It's cool to be in DC right now and see just nothing. It's really interesting. Yeah. So I, I see you're using Westcott lights. Are you going to talk about those today at all? Or is that just uh yeah, we can talk about them. I, I was going to ask you about them, but I, I don't want to like uh, step on your talk later on. If you're going to. No, no, we'll talk about them. I love them. I really, really do. Cool. I've, I've been really interested in that setup. They're kind of neat, uh, neat lights. And, and I think compared to like the Goddick stuff there, they might be uh, creeping up on, on that that market on Goddix, so. I think so. Getting up there with Profoto? I think so, like it's, you know, it's, lights are lights now, so like, I don't know, everything's doing, everyone's doing such a good job. Yes. Of lights, so the camera doesn't know what it's using, it's just, it just wants to see light, so. Right. I don't know, but that being said, I really do like, like the, um, the Westcott stuff. They work really well, I like the, the form factor, I like the size. Um, gotcha. Hey, listen, I got to get this started. Sorry. It is Good. noon or well, noon 04. Sorry. Uh, welcome everybody, uh, to today's presentation. Um, in the studio with Jonathan Thorpe. My name is Thomas Petswinkler and I'm a DC based landscape and documentary photographer, as well as video production manager for focus on the story. Um, Oh, I keep screwing up my slides. There we go. Um, so let's get some housekeeping out of the way. Uh, today we'll be streaming on Facebook. Um, and I, if you want to ask questions, I encourage you to use the Q&A button inside of the Zoom window. Uh, you can use the chat function, but if you choose that route, there's a good chance that we'll miss the question. So let's try to stick with the Q&A function. Um, once we go into the Q&A portion of this talk, if we choose your question, I will unmute your mic and give you a chance to ask the question yourself. Now, with that out of the way, 
let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, Jonathan Thorpe is a DC area based cinematic photographer whose technical ability to light and direct a story rings true in the images he produces. His approach drums emotion yet maintains a level of verisimilitude in the form of hyper-realistic portraiture. Since switching to photography in 2008 from a profession in optometry, Jonathan shoots full-time nationally as well as in the Washington DC area. He's currently a Tamron image master and alongside his photography, Jonathan teaches and lectures around the world, helping other photographers grow confident in their careers and forays into photography. So Jonathan, let me turn it over to you. Thanks. Um, first of all, again, thank you guys for tuning in today. Um, and if you tuned in last week, uh, thank you as well for that. Today's going to be a really cool uh, time. So for those who didn't tune in last time, and for those who are just now tuning in for the first time or whatever, what we're going to do today is, is a legitimate uh, editorial style portrait. This is kind of like what I do. This is my wheelhouse of, of work. Uh, I'm not one who, who just enjoys shooting the for lack of a better term, quote unquote, plain shot. I don't really just want to put someone on a wall and take their picture. I want there to be a, some kind of narrative, maybe some little aspect of humor or something in the shot just to kind of make it stand out. Uh, and that's where this whole cinematic uh, portrait term, I think for me, came from. Cinematic in the sense of the lighting is different, the lighting is very deliberate, and the lighting also plays a role in how the narrative is told. Hey, Jonathan, that, can I interrupt you for one second? Yes. Yeah. Um, when you step backwards, your mic gets uh, quite a bit quieter. So if you could speak up when, I don't, I don't know why that's happening, but just wanted to let uh, you know so that the, our viewers hear it. How's that? Is it still okay here? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I probably just dipped out. Oh, no worries. Thanks, John. No problem. Um, so yeah, so cinematic portrait is just a, it's a narrative form of portraiture where there's some type of produced uh, aspect to it. Uh, so today, it's, it's, it's going to, it's a, kind of complicated light setup. We have a total of four lights that we're gonna to use today. Uh, three of those lights are on the subject and one of those is gonna be on the backdrop to create this kind of like beautiful uh, natural uh, vignette behind uh, the subject. And today who we're shooting is my good buddy, Mark. Mark and I ride motorcycles together. Uh, he's a really funny, sweet guy. Uh, big burly dude, really big, cool beard. Um, the quote unquote cliche, typical biker dude. and to add some uh, character to this whole portrait, we're doing like a juxtaposition. We're putting all these big flowers in his beard and shooting this as a springtime portrait with a big burly angry looking guy and this beautiful beard of flowers. It's gonna be kind of funny, kind of silly, but we're gonna end up getting a pretty cool portrait out of the whole thing when it's all said and done. Now, to make this a little different from other times, I think uh, webinars have happened with, with shoots happening, I haven't tested anything yet. I don't know what my light outputs are, so we're actually gonna figure all this out from beginning to end in real time. And I'll be sharing my Lightroom screen as well as you'll be able to see me uh, at the same time. You'll see how I light, how I decide to build up my lights, and we're gonna see just how it all comes together to form one cohesive image, as opposed to kind of just like picking and choosing and things like that. Uh, so with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and start the whole shoot here. I'm gonna share my Lightroom screen or my desktop that'll have Lightroom on it. Boom, boom. Okay. There we go. I'm not going to be shooting into any type of camera settings. Uh, I'm just shooting raw straight into the camera. I don't have any development settings set up in Lightroom. This is all going straight in. Now, the only thing I did do beforehand is decide what I wanted my camera settings to be at. I'm shooting at F5 at uh, 1 200th of a second at just a 56K white balance, just a daytime white balance. So pretty uh, typical normal settings. I'm not shooting at high speed sync. I'm trying to keep as many things simple about this portrait as I can and just use my light uh, to kind of tell the narrative. So F5 is gonna give me a nice sharp portrait. It's gonna blur the background just a touch. Um, we're shooting on a paper backdrop. For those of you who've never shot on paper, sometimes you get these little wrinkles in it and they're kind of a, annoying to deal with later. So just having it blurred out a little bit will help with some of that wrinkle on the paper. Uh, and then we're just gonna use those lights that I have and we're gonna shoot one by one. Now, I'm shooting today with a Canon EOS R. Uh, I'm using the Tamron 45 uh, 1.8. Uh, I talked about this last time a little bit. I tend to shoot wider lenses on portraits because I want there to be a little bit of distortion, especially in a portrait that's so uh, humor driven like today. 
the more drastic we can make the characteristics of it, the better. Uh, we're using Westcott FJ400 strobes. I'm using the Westcott FJ X2M trigger. This is their universal trigger, works with any uh, camera, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, whatever you got, you can use the same trigger for all of it. And as I've said, we're gonna build lights one by one. So what makes this different than other shoots, and this the way that I shoot, and I talked about this last week, and for those of you who didn't tune in, I tend to light back to front, not front to back. My key light is always the last, uh, last part of my lighting. I wanna make sure I'm getting an interesting light on my backdrop, and then I wanna build everything forward. Now, if you look at my setup, I have, it's kind of hard to see, I think lights are blocking, but Ryan, go ahead and look right here. Uh, I have a light right here in the background, and that's a, an FJ400. Whoops, let me cancel this. There we go. I have an FJ400 back here, and that's just a bare bulb strobe. Uh, there's no modifier on it, that's just gonna be hitting my backdrop and just giving me a nice vignette. On either side, we have two FJ400s with small strip boxes on it. These are, I talked about these a little bit last time. These are very defined light sources that are gonna hit and not let the light fall too far on their face. It's gonna just uh, create little scallops of light down to each side. And finally, our last light is a medium-sized Octabank with an FJ400 as well. This is gonna give us a nice, pleasing light to fill in those shadows that are being caused by the two strip boxes. So pretty, involved with a lot of lights like this, but at the same time, very simple once you see what each light does. So in the shot, there's essentially one, two, those two lights, and three different exposures happening all at once that we're managing the entire time. So what I'll do to start with here, looks like my tether turned off, so we'll get you back up. Oh, Lightroom and your tethering. I know for a fact someone is in the, in the chat right now saying, why aren't you using Capture One? Without a doubt, someone is saying that to me. There we go. Okay, so that being said, we're gonna bring over Mark and have him jump in. Mark, come on over. Mark's gonna have to walk very softly for his beard. <laughs> oh, it looks so good though. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mark. Uh, he actually helped do this beard on his own because I, I couldn't find a makeup artist to help out the shoot today. And so we're flying pretty solo with a crew of two people. Okay, so I'm going to show this to camera. Go ahead and on that thing as best you can. So each light has its own group. And in my lighting setup, C is going to be the background light. The two strip boxes on either side are going to be both under B. And then my key light is A. So we're gonna have a lot of different power outputs and power settings across the board here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off A and B. So now when I fire, only the background light's gonna fire. So as we start to do this tethered capture, the first few frames are just gonna be a silhouette of Mark with that uh, bright blue background uh, lit. Now I already said this once, I don't know what the camera settings are as far as what this light's gonna look like. So we're gonna be guessing here to start off with. That's our first test. I'm gonna drop my camera down here. And we should get a nice tethered shot here in a moment. There we go. So first test, uh, the way I'm looking at this is I think that's too much light on my background. Uh, I want there to be a, a more of a fall off of light. I want it to fall off quicker. So it's just a little spotlight behind them. And we're also getting a little bit of spill coming forward, right? We don't wanna see that light coming forward at the same time. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that down. I wanna keep all my camera settings the same. Right now, the power setting on that is 6.7. That's kind of an arbitrary number as opposed to a, you know, 1 16th, 1 8th, 1 4th. So I'm just gonna move it down to where I think it should be. Uh, we're gonna start, we'll go down to, I don't know, 4.5. So whatever that is in, in the grand scheme of things. And we'll take another shot and see what it looks like. Now you see the difference this time, is we're gonna get that really nice fall off around him. It's gonna create that natural vignette that we're talking about. This is gonna save us some time in editing. And we get that really cool glow. So, so far that's actually pretty good. That's kind of where I wanna be. Um, I could go a little bit brighter and I might do that. Uh, Cause we're also shooting not to edit. We wanna get this done with as little editing as possible so that after it's done, we're just gonna do tweaks in Lightroom. We're not trying to necessarily edit a photo. We're just gonna tweak it 
and make what's already there better. So that's not too bad. Um, I'm gonna go up a little bit brighter on that background. We lose one. <laughs> we lost a flower, everyone, that's okay. So we've gone up a little bit brighter and I went from 4.5 to five. So we'll see what that looks like. And that's probably the right spot I wanna be in. Let's see here. Yeah, so that's, it's a very subtle difference, but there's just a, a hint of more glow from behind and I'm happy with that. While I'm thinking about it, uh, Ryan, turn off the, the VC on that on the lens on the sides of switch. That'll just save battery too. Okay, so background light kind of done. So we have that light and it's ready to go. Now typically I would have most of the stuff done beforehand. Um, but the, the better way of doing it, the, the benefit of doing it this way, if my subject is on set at the same time, then I don't have to do a thousand test shots with them with the key light. I can get everything else set up first and when they step in, it's just a couple shots with my key light and it's done. Uh, in a perfect world, I will be on set first. I'll have an assistant step in and we'll do all these light tests and be done with this. So when the subject does arrive, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of shooting. But today, how this is all set up, I have to kind of test with the actual subject. So it's not optimal, but it's, it's a decent place uh, to start. Okay, so we're gonna keep that light on. We're happy with those light settings and we can move on from there. So now I'm gonna turn on the strip lights, which are those, which is group B on my trigger. And that's either, both of these lights right here. Okay, those are the little strip boxes. And what that's gonna do is provide a really interesting glow around the face while not letting it spill too much forward in the front. So it's just gonna bring out cheekbones and it's gonna define the face a little bit more. Currently it's set to 6.7, which is where it was before. So I'm already, I can already tell it's gonna to be too bright. So I'm just gonna start dialing that back down. And I'm kind of guessing again here, because these are just numbers. Uh, we'll start at six. Let's see what this looks like. And that's actually pretty damn good so far. So this is our background light and our two strip lights. And we're in a good spot so far, right? Uh, it's still a little bright on the, on the side of the faces, so I'm still gonna dial that back down because I don't want a lot of that light spilling forward. We're still getting a lot of light right here in the center of the face on the shot where I want that to be more shadowed so we can get more of a, um, uh, a result from the key light. And something else to notice, I've got these lights pretty close into my subject. I don't tend to have light sources very far away. The further away my light sources get, uh, the less the effect of that source is revealed. And I wanna actually, if I'm using a strip box like this, I wanna see what it's actually gonna do. So by keeping it close, the actual effect of the strip box is there. As I pull it further and further away, you start to lose the effect of the box and it just be, kind of becomes just spill out light. So we're gonna turn that back down because six is probably way too high. Let's try it at five. Five is probably pretty close. Okay. Now five's getting there. So we don't have this really intense, overblown out side of his face anymore. We have just a nice glow around him. And what this is doing is creating a dimensionality in our shot. It's becoming more of a 3D image as opposed to just a flat, flat portrait. Now what I'll do before I actually fire up the key light, I'm gonna turn off both background lights, the, the background light and the, and the two side lights, and we'll take a portrait with just the key light and see what that looks like by itself. So just a one light setup. And then we'll do another shot with everything. We'll kind of look at the before and after of both uh, shots. Now you notice I haven't told Mark to do anything yet because I'm just testing. Once I get everything in place, I'm gonna have him pose and I'll kind of instruct him and direct him from there. I might turn this light down just a touch more um, it's at five right now. I think four or five is gonna be closer to where I need it to be. And when I say these numbers, don't get them confused with aperture. My aperture is still at F5. Four, five, five, six, all those numbers are just the power outputs of each strobe uh, around Mark here. So we dialed it down to 4.5. And again, it's a very subtle difference, but subtlety is good. Less is more. Right? We always, we know that kind of stuff. So we're gonna look at this one. 
and we have a nice good skin texture there now as opposed to let it, letting it blow out too much on a highlight so that's nice i'm happy with that uh it's still loading i'm on a kind of an older macbook air here so you just gotta bear with me as far as the processing power but that's that's a good amount of exposure there we go and it's really really sharp um, that's that's right where i want to be as far as the exposure of the shot so i'm gonna like i said i'm gonna turn off the background light totally I'm gonna turn off those side lights. So now the only light that's gonna fire is my key light. And I haven't tested that light yet, so I gotta figure that out next. Uh, right when I turned on the trigger, it was at F, or not F, it was at 5.5 power output. So this is just one light firing. And you're gonna see something in this shot. You're gonna see that the background's kind of meh. You're gonna see that it's not really, the color is not really showing up that well. And it kind of looks just like a mug shot. And we don't want a mug shot. We're trying to create an interesting editorial portrait. For all intents and purposes, this would work for most people. It's, it's a nice shot. But we want to kind of build more. We want this to be interesting and very editorial feeling. Now, that light is a little too bright. So I'm at power of 5.5. So I'm going to go down to, uh, I don't know, 4.7. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, that's probably a little bit better. And that's loading up. Okay, so you notice our, black, our backdrop is now black. We're not getting those blue lights anymore. We're not getting that blue uh, look and color and texture. And that's because we're controlling light in our studio. We're not letting it spill all over the place. If I pull this light further away, it's then gonna spill and we're gonna get shadows and we're gonna get color casts and we're getting all these, all these other issues. By keeping our light sources close and managing the light output, we can then be more deliberate with our, where our light falls. Meaning I can make this background go black, I can make it go white if I blow it out, or if I can control the lighting, I can keep it blue and keep this like rich kind of uh, glow behind it. So for me, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but that's still a little too bright. Uh, I want this to be a touch darker than what the strip boxes are gonna be. So I'm gonna bring it down just a little bit more. We're at 4.7, I'm gonna go down to a four. So this should be a tiny, tiny, tiny bit underexposed. And that's coming up now. Love Lightroom, there we go. So I'm happy with that. It's a little under what my other light outputs are because I want those highlights to be kind of the star of the show that we, when we turn everything else on. And I want those to be the interesting part of the shot. That's what gives it that, that dimensionality, that hyper-realism, that cinematic stuff. Those are all these deliberate light sources on the shot. So we're gonna go ahead and turn everything on. I'm gonna direct mark now, and we're gonna do a before and after of one light versus all four firing at once. All right, Mark, you or Mr. Tough Guy. Go ahead and cross your arms underneath the beard if you can. There you go. Can you do any eyebrow stuff? Like a, yeah, there you go. And you're gonna look dead at the camera right here in the lens. Again, everyone, uh, this is gonna be all four lights firing at once. And we're gonna see what this resulting portrait kind of looks like. There you go, it looks good, nice scowl, hold that. And you're going to see a huge difference in quality of shot. There we go. Now we have a blue backdrop. We have him lit in an interesting way. Uh, we have the, the story of the flowered beard, which is come kind here, of- Come here, tell me what you need. <laughs> Joe, I think you clicked on. Yeah, I think that was an accident on Joe's part. <laughs> uh, so we have this really nice glow around Mark. Um, I would crop it in a little bit and we're gonna do a little bit of Lightroom editing uh, to it here in a minute. We're gonna shoot some more as well. Uh, I'm gonna turn down the key lights. I want this area down the center to be a little bit darker, but the difference in those two shots is just paramount. You have a black backdrop, kind of flat, non-interesting light. It's pretty, it's exposing well, but when you look at the next shot, it's such a huge departure from the two. Uh, in this, you can start to tell different parts of the story. 
uh, versus you're just kind of stuck with one light and it's kind of flat. Now I can move my one light obviously all over the place. I can have it fall on his right hand side and have shadows go left and I can be a little bit moody, a little bit more dramatic. But the way I like to light is kind of fun and I want this to be an energetic, fun, humorous portrait which requires a lot of light to have like kind of a animated slash kind of glow to it. So I'm gonna turn down this light in the center it's getting a little too much down the center of his face. I don't want there to be so much exposure down the center. I want that to be a little underexposed from the side lights. So we're at four there. I don't know. We'll try it at 3.5. <laughs> Perfect. And I think that's a good exposure. So now in the shoot, what I would do, yeah, I like that. So it's just a little darker down the center. All the highlights on the, on the arms, on the side of the face and whatnot is very deliberate. Um, it's interesting light. You have a nice fall off and it's a nice exposure across the entire face. And the cool thing about lighting this way, and I mentioned this also last week, you get what I call micro shadows. When light falls across something, it's creating little mini shadows in every little bit of that skin texture. And we can see all that interesting skin texture here. If I turn off those lights and just fire off a, a shot with just the key light hitting them in the face, it washes out all that texture. Now for beauty photography, that's fantastic. But for more character driven stuff like what I do, I want those skin textures to come out because that is what, that's, that's the interesting part of the human face. And you know, we see all the details in the beard and the, the flowers and whatnot. So we're gonna fire off a few and I'll try to talk through. And I'll direct Mark a little bit more. Um, and we'll kind of keep shooting here. All right, so even more over the top anger animated, like really like, like uh, Bluto, Popeye, Bluto. Good. Very nice. We're just shooting a few at a time here. And we fire off one more. Give me a, even a bigger scowl. Perfect. And I'm shooting this, you know, too wide on purpose. I know I'm going to crop it later. So we're going to see the edges of the paper. We're going to see those things. Um, I'm a big believer in shoot wide and crop. All of our cameras have really high megapixels, so it's not too big of a deal. That's perfect, Mark. That was great. Um, so just we're going to do two back to back. One very angry, one very happy. Arms the same way. It's funny, when you just smiled, all the, all the flowers moved. <laughs> I will right, start with the angry one. And a big smile. Awesome. <laughs> and Mark's got a great personality. Mark's a funny guy. So the, the scowling photos are not really typical of who he is as a person. For the photo, it works because it's um, <laughs> the smile one's so much better, actually. All right, I think the smile one's the better of the two shots. <laughs> um, uh, and it's just, it's, there's no real intense story behind the shot. It's just something interesting. I wanted to shoot a portrait like this for a very long time. And Mark came through here to, to help me out with it. And honestly, that's kind of right where I want to be as far as the exposure of the shot. Um, I can do one without that background light and all three lights still lighting him up, meaning we won't get a light on the backdrop, but we will have the rim lights. So group A and group B are firing and not group C. So that's that same wrapping light, both sides and the face. And now our background's pretty much, you know, black. So you can really do a lot. Wow, that's like super black. You can really do a lot when you control lights, especially in a studio setting. Once you realize that exposure, there's not just one exposure in an image. And we talked about this. Every photo has two subjects. The actual subject, which is, in this case is Mark, and my other subject is the backdrop. Even though it's just a paper roll, it still plays a very pivotal part in the way that the story is told. Um, with it being black, you kind of lose that whimsy feeling that you would get from that bright, you know, blue glow behind him. Uh, so it's, it's making decisions that are effective in your portrait and that are effective for your narrative. So that being said, uh, Mark, I think we'll do a few more just so we have them. 
Uh, and looking at the shots, I'm pretty happy with what we have. Someone asked the question last week, how many shots do I typically take in a shoot? And I think I answered, I don't know, usually 100 at the most. But I'm also someone who says, once I see the shot that I like, it's over. I wrap it, done. I don't want to, I don't want to spend the next four hours going over a thousand photos in my camera. I want to get to another shoot. So we'll shoot a few more. Like I said, I'm pretty happy with what we have so far and we'll see what else we can get. Let's do um, a couple more scowls because then I'm going to have you do stuff that's probably going to cause the flowers to fall out. So we'll do, we'll get these done first. That's good. I like that. Give me a disappointed parent. <laughs> you, <laughs> you fired that one up quick. All right, so big. <laughs> big smile, big whole thing. And give me an arms cross the same way. That's great. So we're gonna do one more thing, Mark. You're gonna turn a little bit to your side, just a touch. And you're gonna Arms up, you know, pose right to me, very Napoleon, very, yes, the hero shot. That's, <laughs> that's amazing. Perfect. <laughs> have fun with your shoots, guys. Like, just have a good time. Shoot your friends. They're the best models you ever work with. <laughs> oh, that looks great. Let's do one more like that. I like that a lot, actually. Yep, we're losing flowers. You know what? Let's have a flower in your hand and kind of hold it out so you're like this, right up to your face. Good. And bring your eyes right to me. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. <laughs> Let's try one more like that, actually. Let's use the red one. That's easier to see on the backdrop. Bring it a little bit closer to your face. You're going to look at me very, um, very almost, not full of yourself, but very proud of yourself. Let's see. That's, yeah, we'll use that one. So kind of, Think about those old um, Grey Poupon commercials or the old uh, Taster's Choice. Is that, is that, is that weird coffees that had the weird flavors? Amaretto cream and stuff. And bring your eyes right to me. There you go. Bring your face a little bit more to me. It's okay if flowers fall out. Excellent. <laughs> oh man, this is hilarious. All right, those are loading up, guys. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting to watch a shoot kind of evolve because we had this idea when we started off. I wanted to be very angry and scowling at the camera. And as the shot developed itself, for lack of a better term, ha ha ha, camera joke, um, it's becoming this, right? And this is very different from what we wanted to do. But this is a funny narrative and it kind of... <laughs> Mark, you have the happiest smile of anyone that I know. Um, so now the shot's kind of evolved into something else and the story is different, which is totally fine for this. You know, we don't have, we don't have an assignment. We're just kind of doing what we want to do. Uh, and I think, I think we're good with the, we'll try one last thing. This probably is not going to work. But I'm happy what we have, so we're going to try this anyways. Okay, you're going to face me directly. I'm going to hand some of these to you. What I'm doing, guys, is just grabbing some of the flowers. I just got these at Michael's. These aren't real flowers or nothing. But they look real enough for the photo. You're going to throw these at me. Yeah, not chuck them, but just toss them to me. It'll be a one two, three, and right to my camera lens. Uh, <laughs> we'll throw this one too. <laughs> Anything that falls out, we'll throw. We'll see how this looks. One, two, three. If I caught that, I did, but I blocked your face. 
<laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I know that's an annoying laugh, you guys. I'm sorry. But <laughs> that's really funny. Let's do it one more time. Maybe a, a little bit lower. Let's see if that works. I don't know. One, two, three. It's okay, that still works. I'm gonna try one last thing. I don't think going at the camera is gonna work because you're gonna keep your elbows tight and you're gonna throw them right up beside you. Gotcha. And that should be a little bit easier. And animated face, like a big eyes, the whole thing. Yeah. All right, one. <laughs> <laughs> no, you. <laughs> I appreciate the, the effort. Diamonds everything. We'll get it done. All right. All right, we guys. And one, two, three. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> oh man, that's really funny. Let's see, what we got. Yeah. Let's try that one more time. We're getting close to something here. Yeah, it's not bad, right? To get the blue, yeah. yeah. Let me grab some more. So I, I assume you guys can still hear me as I'm walking over here. Um, another thing to consider on these kind of shots is color theory, right? What colors look good together? Blue and green look good together, and they look good on uh, – the green was going to look good on the blue backdrop, so when he throws these up in the air, it's going to be really complementing to each other. So fold these up. There's a couple there. There's another one there. There's a dog here. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> There's those. So we got a bunch this time. There we go. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how they sit in your hand. I hear you. Okay, so when you throw them, yeah, keep them kind of tight. Not in front of your face, but just as close to this area as you can. Right over your shoulders. All right, big fade. Here we go. One, two, three. I think that's going to be a good one. No, oh, that's a perfect one. Perfect. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're gonna stop there. Um, <laughs> those are awesome. Really, really cool. Okay, Mark, you can deflower your beard, which is a hilarious term that I didn't even think about until I just said it. Okay, guys, so that's where I would stop the portrait shoot. Um, I'm happy with that shot. I'm happy with all these shots, and I don't know which one is gonna be you know, the one that I work with. We're gonna just grab one randomly and do a quick uh, edit to what we have here. Unless someone has a favorite. Is anybody, if anybody has a favorite, chime in and I'll work on that one. So we'll go back through all these really quick here. Let's see. And Thomas, if anyone has a specific favorite that they really want to see, just jump in and I'll do it. I don't see anybody answering on that. Uh, somebody said the last one, but <clears throat> yeah, the last one was a nice one. Yeah, that's what I figured. Okay, we'll do the last one. That's my rule, right? I don't, once I see the photo that works, the shoot's over with, so that's typically the one I'm gonna mess with here. Exactly. I'm gonna move this out of the way a little bit. There we go. Okay, first things first, I'm gonna do the crop. We're just gonna get it more to the paper. And Mark, you're, you're welcome to hang out too. You don't have to like dip out if you want to. Unless you got somewhere to go. Oh yeah, let's do it right now. Guys, we're gonna do one shot without the flowers for Mark. <laughs> so he, for Mark's mom, there we go. That's great. Very nice. Hold that one, that's good. And we'll do one last one right here. 
Big smile. Perfect. Cool, man. absolutely, brother. Yeah, I don't think you have a use for a flower beard photo. <laughs> Doesn't really show up in professional, professional life here. So Jonathan, somebody did mention that they liked the flowers much better in the earlier shots in the beard. I, okay. I guess I agree. Like they looked better, but once he started throwing them, that was pretty fantastic too. So. Yeah, I agree. I don't know. I don't know which way I'll go with it either. As far as the quote unquote finished, finished shot, uh, typically in a shoot, I choose one. It's rare that I choose two. One always stands out. So, I mean, we can, we'll edit with one of the ones that are more beard flower centric. It's probably going to be an easier, easier crop too. And I like the one where he was laughing. We'll go with that. That's <laughs> if you guys know, the, you, you, you need to know Mark to know that this is spot on who he is as a person. So let's do this. I'm just going to get, I'm just again, just doing a basic little crop just to clean up the background. So the first thing I'm going to do, my white balance is pretty much where I want it to be. I'm going to do this a little bump in clarity. I don't have any rhyme or reason for this stuff. Uh, meaning I'm just not guessing, but everything is a trial and error. Uh, I'm going to pull my camera over because I have a feeling I'm going to just knock this off this chair. And now it's not a good time to break a camera. How are we doing on battery? Good? Awesome. Okay, so that's our first little thing is just the crop. Listen, Next. while you're getting set back up, let me just say, anybody listening out there, um, don't forget to submit your questions. Um, we'll try to get to all of them today. So thank yep, you. Absolutely. And questions about necessarily anything. It don't have to be about this, this portrait in particular, about anything you got. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bump in clarity. Probably not that far. Let's do 25% or somewhere in that number, 26. We can deal with that. Okay, we're gonna do a little bump in contrast. I'm just doing this by my eye. Again, this is just what I think it should look like. Um, shadows, 40%. That's just gonna bring out some of the, the beard and the flowers a little bit more. And we'll do a sharpen just cause you have to, and it's a raw image. Yes, I got a, I got a hand raise, it looks like. I'm not sure what that means, but someone's raising their hand. And let's look at the highlights. Is that a live question? How do you do that? I don't know, that's fancy. Oh man. I feel like I was in school, that was, that was neat. Who was it that it raised their hand? Joe, did you see? Thomas something, start with a B. Uh. Now we're getting into stuff I don't know what to do with. That's okay. It'll, it'll work itself out. I'm not going to do much with dehaze. Dehaze is something new that Lightroom added, I think like a year or two ago or something. I don't really use it that much though. Because it's a little bit intense. Let's go to the vibrance. Let's just bump that up a touch. And we can do a little bit with color. Uh, luminance, we can mess with our blues and make that highlight go away. Make that highlight stand out a little bit more, which is what I'm going to do. I want that glow. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba. And then let's do a saturation of greens. Help those greens pop even more. We can do a little bit of yellow and purple. There's some purple light colors in there. There we go. And this is kind of where I would stop in Lightroom and then run it into Photoshop and start doing some skin touch up and a bunch of other stuff that takes a bit longer. Uh, I'll go ahead and full screen it. That's kind of my, my finished product here, at least, at least in this part of it. In Photoshop, what I would end up doing is smoothing out all this paper, right? Because that's kind of annoying. We want this really cool, flat, you know, uh, wall behind them, not necessarily all this texture. We don't want it to know it's paper. We want this to have a very cool, flat texture shot. And that's kind of, unless you're shooting at a very far away from something with a very low aperture, it's kind of difficult to, to achieve that with paper. So we'll, I'll smooth that out and that's not a big deal. We'll do a little bit of skin touch up to it. Um, but this is kind of the last, the last portion of it. And that's kind of where it would, where it would end. Uh, 
so yeah, that's, that's, a, that's pretty much a portrait shoot for me. Uh, typically this would go a lot faster. What we did today in the last 45, 40 ish minutes, I would do in about 10. Um, cause I was, I wouldn't talk to her obviously, right? It would be a very quick thing. Once you learn your lights and you learn their effects and what they can do, you typically just kind of know how to set these up on set. So there's, there is a little bit of trial and error to a shoot, but the longer you do this and the longer you work with lights, it becomes just, you kind of just know what's going to happen. And there's no real necessarily necess like trying. You're just, you know that the light's going to be somewhere in a certain range and these lights are going to be somewhere in a certain range. You know what your modifiers are going to do and the effects of those modifiers on the subject. So you kind of, it all comes with just knowledge and, and trying. So you think you could talk a little bit about the modifiers and your choices for them? Absolutely. So strip boxes are my all, always my go-to uh, modifiers for rim lighting. Uh, the light is very constricted. Let me just pull one of these over and we'll turn it around. So I'm using very, very small strip boxes. These are very, very, these are one by twos. Um, but the light is just kind of funneled out of this like a tunnel. And it won't let it fall really too much on the front of the face. It's gonna just stick to this little stripped area, which is important for creating those really cool highlights on the side of the face and also brings out the other cheekbones and the jawline really, really nicely. The background is no modifier on it. It's just a barrel bulb light. I took the reflector off of it because I didn't want the light to be super, super focused on the backdrop. It was creating too much of a hot spot. So, so I just not screaming the background at all or go over Yeah, I'm just, just, it's just a barrel bulb hitting. So there's no, there's no um, diffusion on it. It's just, it's just spilling all over the backdrop. So we get that nice glow around all of them. Okay. Finally, uh, the last light is an octobank, which is up there above my head. This is a medium sized octobank. It's not too big, not too small. Uh, this is my go to lighting modifier. The light that it can create is very, very beautiful light. It wraps well. It's not super, super um, focused to one area. So when using it as a key light, it's nice because it just it hits and just has a nice little tiny bit of fall off around it. It's not really super definitive in one spot. And that gives us a really, you know, pleasing light on the face and whatnot. And the way that I have it boomed above at 45, it's a, it's a light that we're used to seeing, if that makes any sense. Um, when we look at photos that are lit from below and up, our brain tries to kind of scramble and figure out what we're looking at. That, that, that's not very pleasing to my eye. That's not what I'm typically seeing. So I'm basically mimicking, mimicking what sunlight would be as far as the position of the shot. And I have it low enough so I'm still getting catch lights in the eye, which is very important. That's, that's I was going to ask you about the catch lights. Uh, like yeah. how important is that to you or do you add it later or is it something you try to get in camera? I try to get it in camera. Uh, without catch lights, you just, the photo kind of loses it, its, it's, I don't know what word it would be. It just looks kind of flat. Uh, catch lights are just, are nice. And we see catch lights all day long when we're out with our friends and talking to people. That's a normal thing that we look at. So when you take a picture and you don't have catch lights, it's just weird. It looks kind of void of, of personality and of, of being human, actually, for me. So I have, you can kind of see it in, in his left eye right here. It's a little bit, you know, just because it's a little bit more of a squint, but it's clear in the right eye. And I might end up duplicating this one and put it over there just to, to even them out. But yeah, we still have catch lights for sure. Uh, if I raise it up too high, you're going to lose those catch lights. What's going to happen is the brow is going to cause a shadow to fall down the eye and it just darkens everything out too, too much. Right, so right. Where my light's hitting is kind of right here between his eyebrows and letting the light spill out from there. If I was using Beauty Dish or a more uh, focused modifier, then that light hits way too hard and you get a really, really hard hot spot. So right now the light just fills up that modifier and just spills onto the face really, really clean. So uh, real quick, uh, what is your equipment that you're shooting with? Yep, I am using the Canon EOS R. You can go and do a little pan down to that, Ryan, if you don't mind. Canon EOS R, uh, we're shooting tethered with tether tools cable into Lightroom. Uh, we're using the Tamron 45 uh, 1.8 BC. Uh, we're also using Westcott FJ400 strobes, four of those, and a Westcott, flip that around and do one of these. Westcott transmitter uh, to uh, trigger the strobes and, and whatnot. Uh, I was going to shoot 85 today, which is something I just typically don't do. And that's kind of why I didn't do it. It's not really authentic to what my, my shooting is, but I figured people want to see an 85. That's a typical portrait lens. 
But I, I want people to try different lenses for portrait work. Uh, 45 is great. It's a great, great focal length for portrait work. Simply because I have a nice wide shot. And if I did want to, I could easily just crop in, you know, tighter to a face shot. And we can use this as a more of a, a headshot, just as easy. She with 85, it's not, it's not um, distorted enough for me. I like a little bit of distortion. I like a little bit of wideness to my shots. So you like so, that depth that the, that the slight perspective adds to it? Absolutely, in. yeah. It just, it's, it's a part of my, I guess, my style. And I can go in Lightroom and go all the way down and do the, uh, where is it at? Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba. I don't know where it is on here. Oh, there it is. I can enable the profile correction and I can then just get rid of all distortion and flatten it out so it gets rid of the, the 45 whatever distortion, right. which is not much, but that's if I just want to flatten it out. And kind of the, another big reason I shoot wider versus tight is I've always liked medium format stuff. And correct me if I'm wrong, I'm probably wrong in this. A 45 is roughly like an 80 or so on medium format, is that? Is that right about there, yes. And that's a, on like 645 to 66 yeah. format, yeah. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's roughly an 80. So when I remove all distortion um, from a 45, in my brain, it's kind of like shooting with an 85 or an 80 medium format, if that makes any sense. That's kind of, I know it's a, it's a stretch to get there, but in my head, that's kind of where it makes sense for me. And it's field of view. And that yeah, field of view exactly. is a good field of view for portraiture. Um, for a lot of people, traditionally, I think that was a really common field of view for portraiture. Absolutely. We only got into these really long fields of view in the last 40 years. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Okay, so one other question for me. I'm going to just keep asking you my questions, and then we'll skip yeah. to somebody else. Uh, C-stands, I want you to talk about that again, because you, you mentioned it last week, and for anybody who's new here, I want to hear uh, what you think of C-stands and how you haul these monsters around with you. Uh, <laughs> C-stands are great. This is a really heavy duty piece of grip. This will not blow over in a breeze. Um, I don't know if you can hear my assistant who's running the camera right now, but Ryan, do you like carrying C-stands on a shoot? <laughs> you, can, you can say, it. Ryan said no. no. <laughs> um, and no one does. They are a pain. They are terrible to travel with. They're terrible to pack down. Um, but I typically use a boom on one, if not most of my lights. I want to get the stands away because I'm using those modifiers so close in. And if I'm putting a modifier right over top of someone's head, if it's not on a boom, then I'm not gonna be able to get around this light stand. So I need to boom stuff. And honestly, putting a boom on one of the, I just call them the black light stands, those typical light stands that we've seen. Yep. Putting a boom on that with a very heavy light with a giant modifier, it's just begging to blow over. Yeah, even with the sandbag, it's- With the sandbag, you got nothing. Yeah, yeah nothing's, gonna, nothing's gonna work on sandbag either. What I do typically do, I think I mentioned this a little bit last time, is on my, my tortoise base, are they called turtle base? Turtle, turtle, tortoise or turtle? Turtle? Turtle, uh, turtle. Turtle base, uh, the kind where the, sea stand, the stand comes out of the base. I just uh, have started traveling with little 10, 10 pound middle weights, and I put those up on top of the leg and let them sit there. It's easier to deal with than sandbags. They take up less space than a you big one. You mean like heavy. these kind of weights that you lift your yeah, arms, yeah, right? Yeah, middle weights. And you just put yeah. them over the uh, I just put the them over the leg and let them sit up that way. That's a and genius idea. No more sand in your car. No more sand in the car. Uh, you can carry like five or 10 in a little stack. They don't take up a bunch of room and it's just easier to deal with on, on set. But yeah, I, unless I'm traveling, like I, I do a lot of work with the American Dental Association. I do a lot of ad work for them. And that requires me to travel to different offices and shoot portraits and shoot ads there. Mm -hmm. That's the only time where I don't bring C-stands because it's a tight office and it's gonna be small. So I travel with these, um, who makes them? I think Bowens makes them. They're these really small travel light stands that fold up to be about this big. And then they fold out, they're seven foot tall. So those are interesting on set. But I'm also using, I'm not shooting with a boom. I'm just shooting very much just room lit stuff um, and just using light to fill up rooms. But nine times out of 10, it's a C stand every single time. Gotcha. All right. Listen, uh, I think we should probably get to some people's questions here. Yeah. We have a, we have a good list. So uh, we'll hit that. Uh, you want me to keep just, the 
should I What's keep up? the screen? Should I keep the screen sharing or should I exit out of that? People want to keep looking at the photo, you think? Um Hmm. Yeah, keep it up for now because yeah. we can actually scale our screens around and see what's going oh, on cool. that way. Okay. Um, Is it on battery? Cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to put Christian Gurrieri on. Um, hang on. This is so interesting. It's like a radio show calling in. I need to talk to the people like, directly. It's neat. Well, it's doing something odd now. Hey, Joe, you there? There we go. He popped up, but his mic is muted. Okay. It's saying you would like to answer this question live. Okay. We'll skip to the next one and I'll come back. Hang tight, Christian. We'll get to you. Uh, hold on. Actually, I found, I've, we're going to get to Christian now. All right. Oh, we must have lost Christian. Oh, no. Here we are. Okay. <laughs> Unmute. Christian, I have finally figured out how to bring you up. <laughs> You're going to need to unmute your microphone, Christian. Yeah. All right. He is not responding. Um, I will ask the question for him. Okay. Where did the question go? He must have left because the question disappeared off the list. Sure. Or did it? No, here it is. I found it. It moved over to answer. All right. I'll get the hang of this eventually, guys. Sorry for my well, yeah, lack, of, lack of understanding here. All right. Um, I may have missed this, but why do the key light last versus first? Why, uh, what are the benefits and the cons of either? So the reason I do the key light last is I think that those highlights around the face and the background are, I don't want to say more important, but it, it's a very important part of the shot that is tricky to manage. And I don't, I want to get those done first. Uh, and then that key light, we kind of know what the key light is going to look like. We know that we need to see their face. But with the strip lights, I'm sorry, the rim lights or whatever you want to call those, there's very big nuances in how those highlights need to hit the face before they blow out versus actually doing something that's important to the shot. So I just want to make sure everything is, is lit back to front just so I can manage different levels of the shot. And, and this sounds silly, but it's also really interesting to, when you fire up that key light for the first time, it's kind of like a magic trick. You see it all boom at one time, as opposed to building the other way. And that's kind of a, that's a fun thing for me to look at too. Uh, the pros and cons, pros, you're managing your levels of exposure a little bit quicker and easier versus um, figuring out the key light and then seeing, well, now that key light is sitting here and I'm losing the exposure here and I gotta move the key light. Getting these first, this is the tricky part. We know how to light a face, but these are the tricky ones, and these are the ones that kind of make your shots uh, stand out more. Cons, uh, I don't know if there's as many cons to it. Um, I mentioned last week, uh, I grew up, my mom's a painter. So growing up, the way I learned about art was painting in layers. You lay your base coat, you lay your next thing, you do trees, and you do birds, and you do whatever, and you go lay it that way. And you go back to front, you know, it's like a landscape, you, everything's back to front. So that's kind of the way I learned studio lighting. Uh, another pro to it is if you have your, if you're working alone, you don't have an assistant, so you really can't test light. Getting all your background lights first, you don't really need a test subject for that. You can kind of just set things up and get it somewhere it needs to be. So then when the subject does come in, it's just you have one light to test versus testing everything at one time. And it comes together a little bit faster. So our subject is only on set for 10 minutes versus, you know, 20 minutes, which in the commercial world, 10 minutes can mean a big, big difference. Especially if you're working with high cost talent. Yep. You have, there's several shoots I've done in my career that were, you have three minutes to do this portrait, get out and go. I did a photo shoot with the rapper Nas five or six years ago. I literally had one shot to take. I took one and he walked off set and then the shoot was over. So you got to get everything right. And you can't be testing a bunch of different backlights and things like that. Because these are lights that you're not going to be necessarily prepared for because these are gonna fall on a face differently right. than what we're used to seeing. Nice, Nas, how was he to shoot with? Did, like nothing, just showed up, took the shot and left? Uh, <laughs> Nas was great. Yeah. We'll go with that. All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from there. Uh, let's see, we have another question and uh, see if I can get this right this time. It is uh, Dericky Rice is the name I'm gonna
allowed to talk and unmute. Dericky, are you there? Or Dericky Rice? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, there you are. Go ahead. Oh, fantastic. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for doing this, um, all the inspiration. I uh, wanted to know, um, even though with your lighting setups and um, your concepts, um, when you're in front of this subject, um, are you still trying to figure it out? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, I think you're you're uh, you're uh, you have a real heavy delay on your computer for this. You yeah. might want to mute your computer while we're doing this. Um, mute the Facebook. Yeah. Thank there you, Joe. You. Uh, okay. So yes, there is a lot of aspects of still figuring it out. Um, it, it comes down to how much time I have to be at a shoot. If I have a an hour that I can be on location first, then when the subject shows up, there's not too much to figure out at that point. If I can't get into a location, then yeah, I'm definitely figuring it out. But there's always a, a default lighting setup in the back of my head that in case all else fails, I can rely on that. And this is actually that light setup, this three light, sometimes four with a background. But the three lights, that's my go-to lighting setup. That's my foolproof every single time. Uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a bit of still figuring it out when they're on set. And as you saw today, things can change very quickly as far as the progression of the shoot and the style of that shot. Uh, so it's important not to get yourself too stuck on an idea or too stuck on a concept and just kind of let things flow naturally. Uh, there, yes, so to, to paraphrase and to answer your question more direct, I, yeah, there's always a bit of still figuring it out. And a lot of other things, there's, well, how is the light affecting their skin and their hair color and their height and all those things that kind of come into play. So there's always a little bit of figuring it out every time. But over time, those, those variables drastically uh, decrease. And they become really intuitive for you, right? It's, it's, yeah, it becomes, uh, yeah, it becomes like a second nature thing. Hey, guys. I, I like what Dariki wrote in his original question as well, and it's a little bit different than what he asked in person. He was like saying, Jonathan, what are the thing, basic things you do to try to get emotion from your subjects? How do you sort of coach them into the looks that you want? Yeah, um, the biggest fact, the biggest thing for me that helps is humor. Um, I lived in Philadelphia for a long time. And while in Philadelphia, I did some stand up comedy for a couple of years. So there's a, a layer of humor that comes with me naturally. And I have found that once you get someone to laugh or just crack a smile, a, a natural smile, they're going to be much more open to direction from there. There's it's like a there's a trust barrier that comes down there. There's a lot of barriers between you and a subject. And I think as photographers, we forget that. They are trusting us to represent them in a way that is uh, honest and true to who they are as a person for the most part. And you have to get through those barriers in someone. And for me, humor is the biggest one to knock those barriers down. Once they get someone to laugh, smile, or just kind of loosen up a little bit, then they'll kind of do whatever I need them to do for the shot. And there's a level of trust that comes with uh, laughing with someone. All right, thank you. Um, don't be willing to do something that you're su that you wouldn't do for your subject. I've shot with people in the middle of the cold, and I ask them to wear a t-shirt, and I will take my jacket off and be cold with them the whole time. Go through it too. You're, you're not better than the subject. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen other photographers that, you know, they'll, they'll have a model, half their clothes off, and they'll be standing there in a big down coat. And, no, you'd be cold you going them. in. <laughs> you'd be cold with them. Yeah. Thank you, Dariki. Uh, let's see. Our next question is from Jay Sierra. Um, let me go ahead and hit answer live and allow it to talk and unmute. Are you there, Jay? Nope, it's not unmuting. All right, I'll ask the question for him then. He, uh, he just actually wanted you to go over the lights one more time. N nothing major, just a quick run over it, I think. Sure, I'll hop off the chair here. All right. Okay, so going over the lighting one more time, I'll flip this one around just so it's a little bit more accurate to what it was. We'll start with the back, Ryan. So our backlight, 
is just a bare bulb Westcott FJ400. There's nothing on this. It is just a bare bulb strobe that's hitting our backdrop and that's spilling light all over it as opposed to uh, putting a seven inch reflector on it and having it focused more to one spot. Having it hitting so hard here creates a really, really bright spot with a quick fall off. And I wanted there to be a more uh, natural vignette and natural, like a, a cleaner uh, fall off of light around the, uh, the back of the uh, back of Mark. Working back from the, working forward from the back, we have two FJ400 again. These are on strip boxes. I'll turn it to the side so you can see a little bit better. These are very small uh, strip modifiers and all that's doing is it's focusing the light to fall in that same kind of one foot strip right down the side of the face. And that's hitting uh, back of the ear and stopping right by the jawline and the cheekbone. So it's this little strip of light. That gives us those really cool uh, glow uh, highlights around, uh, around Mark. And our last shot, our last light is a FJ400 medium octobank uh, on a boom overhead. And that's just our key light and that's gonna fill in all the shadows that we created uh, with all the other lights in the shot. Perfect. All right, uh, we have a question from chat, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask you that. Um, you have ring lights in the, studio, in the studio. What are you working with or recommend? And do other lights come into play when shooting with a ring light? So those ring lights are actually for makeup. That's what those are in here for, is for when makeup artists are in here doing makeup on, on models and whatnot. And I don't use a lot of ring light stuff. Um, it's great for video right now. We're all doing some type of virtual something or another. Um, and I used to own a, a dedicated flash ring light. And man, it was just annoying to shoot with. Like it's a big bulky thing you have to hold in front of your lens and, and whatnot. Now today, in a perfect world, I would add more lights to this setup. Instead of four, I'd probably use six. And we could talk about what those six lights would do. And one of those would be a typical effect to a ring light. Um, so you have to use a little bit of imagination. So we keep all four lights as they are right now. The other two lights I would add would be over the top of the backdrop. And Ryan, I think you can pan this way. I, have a, I would have a light coming over from the top and hitting the back of Mark's head. And now it's gonna give us a nice uh, from behind hair light. The last uh, modifier and last light setup would be a very large umbrella slash octobank directly behind me shooting on access with the subject and that's going to really fill in those shadows and that's a similar effect to what a ring light would provide it's very flat it's direct in and it fills in shadows and it gives a very very polished animated look i didn't want to throw in six lights today just because that's going to be even more complicated already we already have four um, but in a perfect world this portrait would be six lights i could probably go up to eight if i really started to think about it uh, in that that umbrella or that parabolic that i would use uh, on access with the uh, subject, that would be the same effect as a ring light. Filling in shadows. Cool. All righty, let's see. And uh, the next question is from Joe Boris. Hang on, I'll, I'll unmute him. Joe, are you there, Joe Boris? Yeah. Oh, because we turned the VC off. That's fine. Here we go. <clears throat> You're gonna to need to unmute your microphone, Joe. Uh, just to, thanks. Okay, there you are. Go ahead, sir. Um, yeah, I was wondering uh, about the, I'm sorry, I've been on a, uh, <laughs> another call for a second here. Uh, wondering why you didn't uh, throw the backdrop out of focus by opening up the aperture a little bit to get rid of that uh, wrinkling back there. Sure, um, I, was, I really wanna make sure that uh, Mark was sharp. That's kind of the only, that's the easy answer to that. Shooting at F5, I just want to make sure every detail is sharp from front to back. Yeah, it's, an, uh, it's a great shot and a great concept. I, I love what you did with it. Thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, I, if I had a little bit more space today, and I have a lot of space around me, obviously, but I could also pull him further off the backdrop, still shoot at F5 and get that backdrop to blur out a little bit more. Yeah, um, yeah. In Photoshop, what I'll end up doing is throwing this through the uh, dust and scratches filter. That's a okay. trick that I've learned a long time ago with dealing with paper, running it through dust and scratches and blurring it all out and it retains okay. all the glow and highlights, but it gets rid of those wrinkles in the paper really, really quickly. I appreciate it, thank you. Sure. All right, thank you, Joe. 
Um, let's see, our next question is from Ala Lutsenko. Let me uh, bring, uh, Ala may have left us. I don't see Ala on the list. So here, I'll ask, I'll ask the question. Okay. Uh, how do you store your photographs? Like, I guess your picture files is the question. It just says, how do you store your pictures? Um, yeah, just, I have 5,000 hard drives at my house, basically. <laughs> um, I'm really terrible at photo organizing. Uh, it's rare that I actually back up a Lightroom catalog as well. I don't know what, every time I see that stupid screen, if you don't want to back it up, I'm like, no, I just want to close it. Like, that's it. I got things to do. <laughs> um, but I do, I have... I don't even know how many hard drives I have. I have a, I just have a lot of hard drives and I end up putting like dates on those hard drives in like years and months. So I know somewhat of what's on that shot or that was on that hard drive. At least I know what level of photographer I was. I know that the hard drive from 2006 probably isn't going to be very good to look at versus the hard drive of last month. So have you yeah, ever had to go back and pick something out and uh, you found out that there's like bit rot on the drive and you can't re uh, recall a photograph? Uh, that's happened. Yeah. And I remember asking the client or whoever it was like, why do you want this old photo? This is garbage. Let me shoot something new for you. Um, and I ended up shooting something new for them because I couldn't, the photo can be retrieved. But, you know, I try to update those hard drives and dump them into other ones, you know, as the years go by. Sure. I'm not good at it, but I try to. Yeah, I think we all do. I try to back up mine every year to two years on a new drives and sometimes it just passes by. And it yeah, I just sense. hate it. I hate it. All right. Um, good question, by the way. Let's see. Um, Mark Gilvey. I'm going to, if Mark is still here. Mark, looks like Mark probably must have left. Yes. Well, I'll ask the question then. How long is the boom bar and who makes it? And, and the C stands for that matter. Uh, that's, a, that's a hell of a question. This is... It's all, um, these are all Avenger C stands, I think. More or less, they're all Avenger C stands uh, in studio. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long this boom is. It's long, it's, it's probably a seven foot, eight foot boom. It's the Avenger uh, DL650, or D, I'm sorry, D650. Uh, so in studio we have, what's that? Maybe that indicates six and a half to 650. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, in studio we have pretty much all Avenger stuffs, but honestly, if I'm traveling and I'm bringing my own gear, I just use those, uh, the cheap newer C stands you can get off Amazon. They're like $60 or 70 bucks. Yep. And those they're are great. Just, you do everything else, you know? All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have a question from Philip Gerlach. Let me turn him on and make sure he's still here. Aha. There we go. Philip, unmute your microphone. Oh, hi. I didn't realize I uh, would actually be talking. Yeah, uh, yeah just uh, this is a great course. I appreciate the fact that it was put out there for free. Um, curious, do you ever shoot uh, um, using more portable setups with like the Canon and Icon strobes using the same multi-light setup instead of using with the larger Westcott strobes? Uh, no, I don't use a lot of speed light stuff. Um, it's, there's some cases where I can use a speed light on set. But for me, I need that extra power that you get out of a strobe. I need a big, large hit of power. So if I'm taking these outside, because they're all battery operated, um, I'm typically shooting at high speed sync. I'm shooting at one, you know, five thousandth of a second and using high speed sync on the strobes. You can't really overpower the sun uh, with speed lights and whatnot. So there is ways you can honestly, you know, put three to four speed lights in a single modifier and shoot it that way and you'll get a big burst of light. But man, that gets expensive really, really fast. Uh, I always thought it was funny, like Joe McNally will go into a shoot with 45 speed lights that he got from Nikon, and you start adding up those costs, it's a way more expensive than just using four strobes, you know, <laughs> like on set. So this is my, my travel set. This is my go-to stuff. I know it's not necessarily easiest to travel. Uh, I can fit three heads into a single backpack with a couple lenses, because they are pretty small strobes. Uh, but this is my this is my go-to travel stuff. So that's where the assistant comes in. <laughs> Sometimes, more often than not, I'm lugging this stuff around by myself. <laughs> Great. Great, thank you. Sure, thank you, Philip. 
Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. And so those are those Westcott. They're about the same size as size as the Goddix four hundred. Uh, uh, what's it called? The four hundred watt second ones. They're about the same size, correct? Yeah, I would say so. I'm going to turn this one off. Maybe not. There we go. I'm fascinated by these these Westcott heads. That's why I've been asking about them so much. Ooh. They are super super cool. Um, let me pull this off. Maybe not. That's all stuck on there. I'll get it later. But like once you pull the battery out of these, that's a really small head. And that'll fit, you know, anywhere. That's going to fit any little backpack you got. So I just pull the batteries out. These go in another place. But when they're all, you know, when they're put together, they're still a really small footprint. And they weigh nothing. They're very, they're just, it's a really cool, it's a really cool light setup. Yeah. It really is. These are really neat. It looks really nice. All right. We have a question from Anonymous, so I'll ask it because, um, well, I can't let Anonymous answer. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you feel about wardrobe? Do you discuss this with your models slash clients? For example, I found your model shirt graphics to be very distracting with the flowers and ink. Sure. Uh, in this shot, I told Mark to wear motorcycle stuff because we're trying to play off the whole biker thing. You're wearing a Harley shirt? Yeah, he's wearing a Harley shirt, motorcycle manufacturer. Um, wardrobe does play a huge role. Here in D.C., there's not a lot of options for wardrobe stylists for shoots. Um, I've worked with a few, and it's typically it's kind of a, they go to Target and buy a bunch of stuff and return it. Um, wardrobe does play a big role in it. It depends on your narrative and your shot. Uh, if this was a 1950s, styled shoot and thought and process mm -hmm. obviously what he's wearing wouldn't work and his beard probably wouldn't work either because that's not really indicative of that era so it all comes down to what your narrative is as far as what the wardrobe what role the wardrobe plays in it for this i wanted it to be biker through and through i want to see tattoos i want to see those the harley davidson shirt all that stuff so for me it, it tells that narrative but it, that's not you know that's your decision you know what narrative you want your photos to tell all right. Thank you for that. Let me get that one out of the way. Okay, we have one question left, unless something else. Let me check over in the chat real fast to see if anything else came oh. up. All right. Uh, the one question is from Linza Cazares. Let's see if Lin Linda's, Linda is still here. Uh, she appears to be. So, Linda, I'm going to... I'm going to have you take my shot after this. I'm going to unmute you, Linda. <laughs> oh, nope. She uh, appears to have. Okay. Linda, I'm here. There. there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Linda. Hi. Great. Great. Uh, this week, last week had been fantastic. So my question is, how similar or different would a light setup be for two or more people in the same shot? You've got four lights going here. You said you might even do this sometime with six lights. I can't imagine how many lights you would have for, for two or more people. Uh, what would you do different? So the only thing different for two people in this situation would be adding one more light. And that light would go up behind the backdrop and that would spill in between them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you have, you know, your two outside lights here, which are going to give, so think about two people side by side. This light would light one half of the face on that side of the photo. And that would light the other half of the face on the other side of the photo. And then that backlight that's coming up and over would go between them and light the other sides of their faces for you. So you get essentially uh, three light sources on each person, meaning your key light and your two light wrapping sources. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. All right. That is the end of the questions. Well, let's see. I think. Hold on. Oh, nope. Something just popped up. Let me. Uh, this is John Cornicello. Um, hey, John. Me, I know John. Let me pop him up real fast. He is John Cornicello. A lot of talk. All right, John. Go ahead. Hey there, Jonathan. I was just wondering if you've tried the um, Canon compressed draw. You know, we're talking about storage mm. on the CX3. Uh, no, I haven't. And that's probably a great idea, especially for tethering. It's probably a, a yeah. It's it's pretty pretty large size drop, like sixty percent size, and I've not been able to find any difference, even in under and overexposed images, still had the same raw capabilities. Oh, cool! Yeah, I'll look into that for sure. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's really nice that uh, Canon brought that into the new cameras because uh, other companies have been doing it for a while and it, I've never seen a difference in the files. So that's fantastic that Canon's doing that now too. I didn't know that was a thing. I'm just looking at it right now. Yep. Look at that. It yeah, really it cuts down the size. Recently. Yeah, it sure does. Huh. Well, there you go. I learned something today. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, John. John. <laughs> Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you, buddy. All right, that is all of the questions, Jonathan. Cool. So let's see. Um, let me go past all my questions. I wrote, wrote all those questions out earlier. So, all right. I want to thank everybody. Let me go share my screen now. Yeah, I'll turn mine off. There we go. All right. Is my screen showing? It should be. There we go. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I want to thank Jonathan for the amazing tutorial. Man, this this and last week put together have been such a great uh, opportunity to get a massive amount of information really fast for, for all of our uh, members and all the viewers out there that came from other places. I know Thank we've you. shared this all over the place, so it's national and international, which is nice. That is awesome. Um, we also want to thank Tamron because without Tamron, this would not be possible. And you, your screen's course, not sharing, Thomas. It's not sharing? How's that? Is it sharing now? Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. I thought I thought it said it was sharing. I just realized I had hit the wrong button. All right. So we want to thank Tamron. Without Tamron, this entire presentation would have been would not have been possible. And uh, give a shout out to Union Two Hundred Six in Alexandria, which is the studio that Jonathan is uh, is shooting at currently. Uh, you can go and rent space there. You can become a member and uh, get discounts on your rentals. I think that's how it works. So, yep. um, and uh, so you should go check them out. All right, um, coming next week, if you're familiar with Homeland, uh, not Homeland, is it, if you're familiar with Homeland, yes, Homeland on Showtime, uh, you'll recognize this photo. So next week we will have Lloyd Wolf and he will discuss this photograph and the story behind it. So that hmm. should be a fantastic show again. Um, oops, wrong button. <laughs> Keep hitting those wrong buttons. All right, all of that said, Jonathan, do you have anything more you wanna say? No. Uh, if you guys, again, have any questions, uh, you can find me on Instagram, jthorpephoto. Uh, email is info at jthorpephoto.com. Website is jthorpephoto.com. Twitter is jthorpephoto. My branding is quite on point. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys may have about photos, lens choices, uh, lighting, whatever you guys got. Happy to, happy to help. And that's fantastic. It's, it's nice that you're so open about answering questions about everything, including things that have nothing to do with what you're doing. So that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, let's see, we'll be posting a video of today's presentation on our website, on Facebook, and on our YouTube page. So you can find it there if you need to watch it again. And uh, I want to thank you, Jonathan, Joe, everybody else for joining us today. And uh, you guys have a great week. Thanks. Have a good one. Take care.